Hi, it's Katrina. My friend David is going to be helping me out with the voiceover today, so I hope you enjoy. Number 10. Sodom and Gomorrah In the Bible, Sodom is a place of intolerable sin. Sodom and its sister city Gomorrah were both places where the Lord had no presence. That is to say, people living in Sodom and Gomorrah did whatever they wanted, they didn't worship God, and they committed all the sinful acts they could. Sodom and Gomorrah were so disgusting that God himself rained down burning sulfur to destroy them. Even though Abraham bargained with God to spare Sodom, or at least those few righteous residents still left, the Lord refused. And when Abraham looked back, he saw nothing but smoke rising from the land like the smoke from a furnace. What if this truly happened in real life? Researchers investigating the ancient site of Tel El Haman believe they may have just found evidence of biblical Sodom. The archaeological site is located near the Dead Sea in Jordan. It was a city 3,600 years ago that was annihilated by an unbelievable apocalyptic event. Archaeologists were a bit confused when they started finding melted rooftops, pieces of pottery that had disintegrated, and stone that had been exposed to unimaginable heat. They also found that after the biblical catastrophe of 1650 BC, the settlement remained inhospitable and abandoned for at least 600 years. Researchers believe the destruction was caused by an airburst. A meteor entered the atmosphere and exploded before it could hit the ground, detonating with thousands of times more force than a nuclear bomb. This would have leveled the city and melted everyone in it. Those who witnessed the blast from miles away and went to investigate likely would have thought God himself was responsible. This is why the Vatican doesn't like these kinds of discoveries. The archaeological site seems to confirm a biblical story, but only based on real scientific evidence. Sodom may not have been destroyed by God, but by a big rock from space. Number 9. A Biblical Love Poem there is a love poem in the Bible full of extremely inappropriate content. The Song of Solomon, or Song of Songs, is a work of strangely sensual poetry that portrays the love between the female protagonist of the poem and her male lover. And while songs are found in hundreds of biblical texts, this one is particularly perverse. It includes graphic descriptions that some might consider titillating and borderline rated R. The poem includes cringy metaphors such as grazing among the lilies and drinking from the juice of my pomegranates. I don't think we need to imagine what any of that might mean. But here's what makes the song really unusual. It's the only work in the Hebrew Bible that focuses strictly on the romantic love between humans rather than the love between humans and God. It's a wonder the poem even made it into the Bible, never mind that it's still in there today. The Song of Songs is one of the most controversial pieces of biblical text. It says nothing about God, it doesn't teach any wisdom, it just goes on and on about two lovers who are in harmony with one another and apparently really sweaty. Though, of course, many scholars have argued the interpretations are all wrong and that the metaphors are really describing the relationship between Israel and God. Even if that is the case, the content of the Song of Songs is still highly unusual. And now for number 8. But first, it's shout-out time. Big thank you to Rich Raz and Derek Teague for supporting this channel. Be sure to subscribe and join the Origins Explained family if you haven't already. Number 8. St. Valentine's Bones Every year on February 14th, couples around the world celebrate their love. If you happen to be a devout Christian, you might pop by a church to give praise to the patron saint of lovers. But in all honesty, most people don't realize Valentine's Day is a ghoulish tale of murder and the desecration of a corpse. In the 3rd century AD, St. Valentine was beheaded. He was speaking out against a Roman ban on performing marriages. The Romans didn't like anyone speaking out against them, and so Valentine had his head chopped off. Not only that, but his bones were supposedly ripped apart and then scattered across the world. It's because Valentine spoke out about marriage that he became the patron saint of love. He was an ordinary man that felt strongly about what he believed in. He wasn't a baby cupid with a bow and a heart-shaped arrow. But where in the world are St. Valentine's bones today? Well, that's difficult to say. There's a church in Dublin that claims to have St. Valentine's physical heart. There's a skull on display in Rome. And in Glasgow, there's a skeleton in a golden box that supposedly belonged to Valentine. A piece of his shoulder bone can be found in Prague at a basilica, and in Madrid, some of his remains are in a sealed case. Nobody knows where Valentine is buried. 
he could be in the Vatican, he may never have even existed. In 1969, even though Valentine was already a canonized saint, he was removed from the general Roman calendar. Church officials say he's just too mysterious and there's just too little information about his life to celebrate him. Yet here we are, annually celebrating Valentine's Day in every country on the planet. Number 7. The Photo of the Crucifixion Could the Vatican be in possession of a real physical photograph of the crucifixion of Jesus Christ? And if they are in possession of such a photo, could they have gotten it with help from a time machine? If you believe in the legend of the chronovisor, the answer to both questions is yes. There has been a shocking rumor circulating for nearly a century that the Vatican is in possession of time-traveling technology. The story starts in 1925 with a priest by the name of Marcello Pellegrino Annetti. We know he was a real person and that he was a respected musician, scholar, and Christian, but he also made an outrageous claim that he was part of a team involved in traveling backward in time to witness the crucifixion of Christ. He and the team then photographed what they saw and brought the picture back to the present with them. Father Annetti was most likely lying. He also claimed to use the magical time-traveling device to watch the lost Greek play Thyestes. No evidence has ever emerged that the Vatican is holding a time machine in their archives. In all likelihood, Father Annetti is just trying to prove the crucifixion really happened by making up an outlandish story. If there really is a chronovisor, a mysterious machine for time travel, it's doubtful the Vatican is the only organization who has figured out how to build one. Number 6. A Miracle The Vatican does not declare miracles very often. There are extremely specific rules behind confirming a real miracle performed by God. One of the most recent miracles confirmed by the Vatican involved a boy named Jake Finkbonner. In 2006, Jake hit his head while playing basketball at school in Washington State. He developed a headache, a fever, and he had to be rushed to the Seattle Children's Hospital. It turned out Jake was afflicted by a flesh-eating bacterium known as Strep A. The flesh-eating bacterium traveled down his face, neck, and into his chest. Luckily for Jake, it didn't travel into the brain and kill him. His parents said it was because he was protected by a Mohawk Indian who lived 350 years ago. The doctors were unable to beat the infection. Jake was about to die. He was given his last rites, and just before death took him, the infection stopped. Doctors couldn't believe it, calling it a very real miracle. But according to the family, a close friend had placed an ancient relic that belonged to Kateri Tekakwita on Jake's pillow just before the infection stopped. It's believed the relic was what saved Jake's life. Kateri Tekakwita lived 350 years ago. She converted to Catholicism and was elevated to the status of blessed in 1980 by the Vatican. That's one step before sainthood. After Jake's seemingly miraculous recovery, Kateri was credited with saving the boy's life and was promptly elevated to the status of saint. One part the Vatican probably would rather nobody knew is that Jake still needed 25 more surgeries after his so-called miraculous recovery. The truth is that it was medical science that saved Jake and a freak coincidence that the infection stopped. Yet the Vatican claimed it was a real miracle and even went through the trouble of creating a new saint because of it. Number 5. The Evil Pope Sergius III Pope Sergius III became the ruler of the Papal States on January 29, 904. He would rule the Vatican up until his death, a mere seven years later in 911. This particular time in Italy was rife with violence, with many classes of aristocrats fighting for maximum power. Sergius happened to come into the papacy by way of treachery. He seized the throne for himself from anti-Pope Christopher, who himself had deposed Pope Leo V and stole the throne. This was a time when being pope was about as dangerous as going swimming with sharks. 16th century historian Caesar Baronius called it the Dark Century. Once in power, Pope Sergius III went about doing whatever he wanted, which was nothing good. A thousand years later, and he's still seen as one of the worst popes in church history. He was an unscrupulous man who allegedly murdered both his predecessors, fathered an illegitimate son who later became pope through nepotism, and was just generally disgraceful and ruthless. Number 4. World Domination in 2011, the Vatican accidentally admitted their plans for world domination. Vatican officials called for the establishment of a global authority, a one-world government that should regulate all financial markets and individual governments. 
It may sound like a conspiracy theory to say the Vatican wants to control the world, but it could be true. The Pontifical Council for Justice and Peace, an office within the Vatican that usually releases statements on social issues, released a document. In the document, there were some bizarre lines about how the world should be run by a single government. The document essentially said that since the 1970s, financial institutions have been acting outside the rule of law. Moving forward, a single regulatory body should manage all the global financial markets. The document also said that nation-states dissolving is good, because the more worldwide laws there are, the better. Globalization, although it could have negative effects, is ideal for unifying people and having a consistent rule of law. The document was really long and full of strange ramblings, but the underlying message was clear as day. The Vatican is secretly hoping for world domination. Do you think the Vatican could achieve this in your lifetime? Let me know in the comments below and be sure to subscribe so you don't miss out on the latest videos. Number 3. The Dark Truth of Mother Teresa If Mother Teresa has taught us anything, it's that the Vatican will make pretty much anyone a saint. The famous nun was declared a saint in 2016 by Pope Francis. What the Vatican doesn't want you to know is that Mother Teresa was kind of a bad guy. The official word from the Vatican is that the nun performed miracles. She supposedly cured two separate people of their tumors. However, doctors working closely with the case said that the people were treated with drugs, not faith. Throughout her life, Mother Teresa was depicted as a selfless healer who spread Catholicism and goodwill in India, helping the poor and the sick. Yes, she helped lepers and built homes for orphans. However, Mother Teresa was mainly concerned with converting people to Catholicism. The New York Times recently wrote that Mother Teresa was less interested in helping the poor and more interested in using them to fuel the expansion of fundamental Roman Catholic beliefs. There are those who argue that even if Mother Teresa had ulterior motives, at least she was helping people. But she may not have helped anybody according to those who have been to her medical centers. The medical facilities Mother Teresa built were meant to help people, yet her patients were typically put in situations that made them even sicker. One journalist compared Mother Teresa's main location for her missionaries of charity with the Bergen-Belsen concentration camp used by Nazi Germany. Number 2. The Forgotten Tenets Some Catholics pick and choose which words of God they follow very carefully. It's understandable that after 2,000 years, Catholicism has been altered here and there. A lot of things have happened, and it makes sense. Popes and cardinals at the Vatican have helped to change the face of Christianity to better suit modern times. Yet some things go directly against the word of God, as is written in the Bible. For example, the Bible takes a very clear stance on religious uniforms. In Matthew 23, 4, 5, it mocks people who wear religious outfits as carrying heavy burdens. Try telling that to the Pope. The Bible also explicitly says that all Christians are part of a holy priesthood and anyone who believes in God is a priest. That means everyone attending church on Sunday has just as much right to preach as the man standing on the stage in his uniform. There's some other pretty outrageous things the church is blatantly ignoring. For example, priests are forbidden from being called father. It says in Matthew 23, 9, not to call anyone on earth father, and that there is only one father, he who is in heaven. The whole point being that anyone being called father is claiming divinity for themselves, a big no-no in the Bible. Oh yeah, and the Bible also says bishops are supposed to get married. The early church hated women so much that they forbade their officials from marrying them. Number 1. The Shroud the Shroud of Turin is the most important religious relic in the world. It's because the relic really exists, whereas things like the Holy Grail and the Ark of the Covenant have never really been found. The Shroud of Turin is allegedly the same piece of cloth that was used to wrap the body of Jesus Christ after his crucifixion. The Shroud contains the image of a man, which is said to be the face of Jesus. However, nobody has ever been able to say with complete scientific certainty that that shroud was wrapped around Jesus' corpse. Scientists carried out carbon dating tests in 1988. They found the cloth to be from 1260 AD, 
1,200 years after Jesus, the study forced the Archbishop of Turin in Italy to admit the shroud was a hoax, but that didn't go over very well with the Vatican. Other scientists soon came forward to say the initial tests used a piece of fabric that had been sewn into the shroud after it was damaged in 1532. The next round of tests done in 2005 showed that the shroud came from over 1,300 years ago, but less than 3,000 years ago. In other words, it was dated back to the days of Jesus Christ. There's no way of saying for sure, but many speculate the Vatican had something to do with the secondary testing. It is possible the Vatican did not like their holiest relic being called a fake, and so they had their own scientists interfere and lie to the whole world. What do you think the truth is behind the Shroud of Turin? Let me know your thoughts in the comments and thanks for watching. Be sure to hit subscribe if you haven't already and come back soon for more shocking videos from the channel.